Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody's faces. Good to see everybody smiling and worshiping God together. Uh, Corbin said that that I'm fond of saying this, and, and I am, that it's not an accident that you're here. God has a plan for you. I think he has a corporate plan for the body of Christ, that in the body of Christ, there is blessing and salvation. He has a plan for each one of us as individuals. Each one of us is known by him intimately. Every hair on our head is numbered by him. There's nothing we can hide in the darkness from him. He knows all and he loves you. And he has a plan for you to be incorporated into the body of Christ where there is blessing and there is life. Uh, what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks are red flags. Are you con- familiar with the concept of red flags? Like warning signs? Uh, young professionals and anybody single, dating, you know, you got to watch out for those red flags. Uh, there are observable warning signs we call red flags. I remember from my childhood reading this Far Side comic that nature itself has its own warning signs. This is how nature says, do not touch. A rattle, perhaps something spiky, or a cat raising its hackles, or the crazy guy on the street corner with a bazooka. That's how nature says, do not touch. Uh, For me, I need really clear warning signs, like red, red flags, uh, because I'm not always that smart. I remember years ago, I had a D time with a brother at Famous Dave's Barbecue, which was awesome, but I got sick from food poisoning while I was there, and I was not feeling great for a good 24 hours, and the moment I could start moving again, I went out and had Chipotle. Much to my wife's, uh, against her warnings, and I paid for it. I was not ready yet for that. So I need really clear like warning signs. I need it to be spelled out for me. Uh, And we're all at times not that smart, just being honest, right? And and sometimes the, the damage that can happen when we ignore warning signs is much worse than just getting some food poisoning, right? Marriages have been shipwrecked because both uh, man and woman did not heed some warning signs early on. And there were some serious issues that uh, led into divorce even. Many businesses have failed because business partners did not look at warning signs. They had the money, they had the dream, but they maybe didn't think through their plan well enough. And all of us can relate to this at some level. Because we all live in a world that is actively in rebellion against God. He has set red flags all around us, and we constantly ignore them to our own shame and disaster. So we can all relate with this. It started with don't eat from that tree. It started in the garden. Just don't eat from that one tree. Red flag all over. And and. Ever since then, we have not been listening. Simple rules we neglect. And what I want you all to know this morning uh, is that there are warning flags placed in this world for our safety, not for us to be denied something wonderful. God gives us warning signs so that we don't step into danger and ultimately death not because he wants to keep us from delight. And so while red flag seems like a really negative concept, it's actually a really positive concept because if you heed the warnings, you can enjoy life. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at a couple of red flags. Next week, we're going to talk about familiarity, how it breeds contempt. It's going to be our Easter service. And so we're going to just come back to the cross and the resurrection and say, have we grown too familiar with the old, old story? And that's a red flag if we've gotten too familiar with it. Uh, then the next week, we're going to talk about itching ears. If your ear is a little itchy, that's a red flag. It's a warning sign. <laughs> Don't be too hungry to hear what your itching ear wants to hear. Week after that, we're going to talk about irreverence. The, the red flag of when somebody just speaks rashly, doesn't have the right respect, especially for God. That's a warning sign. And then lastly, inaction. There's no good reason why that's not capitalized. Um, 
thematically, it kind of works, right? I should have been more active to capitalize the I in an action. But that is a warning sign. If we're getting a little too lukewarm, it might feel comfortable, but we should actually be warned that inaction can lead to disaster. The big idea for today, as I'm just introducing this series, again, is that red flags are a warning against death, not against delight. God wants us to enjoy life, and that's why he gives us these red flags. The passage we're going to look at is Deuteronomy 30. We're going Old Testament, and we're coming to the passage where Moses is at the end of his life. He's wrapping up the book of Deuteronomy. He's 120 years old. He's tired. He's ready to pass the torch. And he's telling the people, look, the Lord has laid before you life and death. Choose life. The actual geographic location where this is supposed to take place, where a proclamation of blessing and curse of life and death is a place called Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I want you to have this picture in your mind as we read our passage, because it was on these mountains that blessings and curses were proclaimed. To your left, you see Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. Tradition holds that Mount Gerizim is more flourishing and green, but Mount Ebal to your right has more stone on it and is more rocky and less flourishing. And so there's an actual visual representation of blessing on Mount Gerizim and curses on Mount Ebal. So we're going to read this passage. Keep that in mind. C. I have placed before you today life and happiness and death and adversity. In that, I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments so that you may live and become numerous and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but allow yourself to be led astray and you worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will certainly perish. You will not prolong your days in the land you're crossing the Jordan to enter and take possession of it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have placed before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding close to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, so that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. You hear the paternal love and concern, don't you? These red flags are a warning against death, not against delight. Lord wants us to enjoy long life. And because of this, he really, really wants his people to see the red flags. He wants them to be very clear. And he gives us Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim as this picture of life and death. In Deuteronomy 11 and Deuteronomy 27, in two different places, they are told when they enter the promised land to go onto these mountains and proclaim the blessings and curses. They were told to go on Mount Ebal, the curse mountain specifically, and to erect an altar there where they would do sacrifice for sin and they would proclaim the curses. Meanwhile, six of the 12 tribes would be on Mount Gerizim proclaiming blessing. And on these mountains, they were also to write on stone a list 
of blessings and a list of curses that you can read in Deuteronomy, very specific lists. And on stone, they were meant to be placed on these mountains as a memorial for generations to come. In the 1980s, Mount Ebal was excavated and they discovered this altar, Joshua's altar. And they dated it correctly to the time that Joshua was in the land after the conquest of Jericho and Ai on the west side of the Jordan River. Sure enough, they did as the Lord commanded. You can read about it in Joshua 8. They went atop Mount Ebal and erected an altar. They also found animal bones and did studies to see what kinds of animals these were. 97% of them were kosher animals that were fit for use on a Jewish altar. Other animals, of course, being in the location would have died and left some bones. That accounts for the other 3%. But it's very conclusive that this was the altar the Lord had commanded on Mount Ebal. Nonetheless, some scholars believe that there's no way they could have written down blessings and curses because there has not been evidence of a written language among the Hebrew peoples anytime before 1000 BC. The time of the conquest was around 1400 BC, 400 years prior to any record of written language among the Hebrews. Well, there's a new way of doing archaeology that's changing the archaeological world. It's called wet sifting. You understand archaeology is not always a precise practice. You're digging sometimes with pickaxes, sometimes with just little brushes, but a lot of dirt is being moved until you find something. And some artifacts are very small and they get lost in a pile of dirt. And so what's happening now is through wet sifting, archaeologists are going back into dig piles, which are basically dirt mounds from where they've dug, and they're going through finding minute artifacts. In 2019, reported on in 2022, they found one of the curse stones. Yeah. It's lead. It's folded lead. Uh, that's why you see the bottom picture there. And they have to use special scanning technology to see what's inside it. They can't just open it up. But they found writing. And I don't know if you can see it here, but there is a little image there that's not just some bumps on a stone. Uh, up here is another one. And this is Proto-Hebraic alphabet. What's more, what it says is the word curse, and it says the word Yahweh. There's no doubt that this is the cursed stone, okay? And they've dated it back to 1400 BC. Anybody see Avatar 2? Great movie. And in the lead up to it, a lot of people were wondering, is there still a cultural interest in the Avatar films? And of course, it there was because Avatar 2 now stands in the top five grossing films of all time. And so on Rotten Tomatoes, every single reviewer was saying, don't bet against James Cameron. Don't you dare bet against James Cameron. He always comes through. Hey, don't bet against the Bible. Don't bet against God's word. If it says that they were there on Mount Ebal, they were there on Mount Ebal. And sometimes it takes a few years for the archaeology to catch up. But don't bet against the Bible. God wants to make things clear for us because he loves us. And because he's God, if he wants to make it clear, he can make it clear. It doesn't have to be complicated or difficult. And he wants it to be clear that set before us are two paths, a path of life and blessing and a path of death and curse. He wanted the Israelites to see it clearly, red flag. And today, he still wants us to see it. Red flags. Problem is, we often miss the red flags, not because God has made it unclear, not because it's so complicated or so vague, but because we allow ourselves to be blind. It says in verse 17, if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but allow yourself to be led astray and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will certainly perish. It is not an accident 
when we go astray. You may say, Luke, but there are people who lead others astray. And that's true. And certainly they will be held accountable for their error. They will be held accountable for what they do. But for those who are led astray, won't they be held accountable too? Aren't each of us, especially adults, accountable for ourselves? What we allow ourselves to listen to and what we allow ourselves to believe? Absolutely we are. I mean, imagine I've got my cute little dog, Judah, and I go away for a week and I forget to feed him. I neglect him. Hopefully he gets into my pantry and finds something to eat. But when I come back, am I off the hook because it was an accident? Am I off the hook because I just forgot? Or am I responsible for neglecting my dog? I'm responsible. And just because it's accidental and unintentional doesn't mean it's excusable. Doesn't mean it's justifiable. Just because we accidentally get led astray, we unintentionally believed a falsehood, it doesn't mean it's excusable and justifiable. Each one of us is accountable for what we believe. And I want to give you a couple of ways we can just be wise and notice some red flags and not allow ourselves to be led astray. One of the first things God was trying to tell his people about, warn them about, was the peoples around them, all of the other nations in the land that they would go to inhabit, they did some terrible practices. I mean, we're talking child sacrifice. He said, look, sometimes you'll see little festivals where they're having their wine and having a party and it seems like fun. Don't do it. Don't live like they live. It starts off as a party and it ends with child sacrifice. Don't allow bad company in your life. Uh, we as people are mimetic creatures. It means that we, we learn through miming, through mimicry. Little children learn how to speak and act from their parents. Sarah was telling me this morning that she's a lot like her father. There was actually a time that her father and her said the exact same thing with the exact same body language simultaneously. Because we learn through mimicry especially when we're young. And so young people, this is especially important for you to hear. Do not allow bad company in your life. Do not allow. They might be held accountable if they influence you in a bad way, but you are accountable if you allow yourself to be tied up with bad company. For the grownups, we're not immune from this either. We have to be careful what we are allowing in our lives Amanda and I were talking this week, what a difference it makes when a man or a woman chooses a godly spouse. I mean, it really can make a difference. It can change the course of a person's life. We've seen many people lose their faith because their spouse was not godly. Now, I want to say to anybody who has um, a challenging marriage or maybe has a mixed marriage between a believer and a non-believer, where the ideal is lacking, grace abounds, okay? Uh, there is not a uh, promise of curse just because we make mistakes, okay? There are many marriages where maybe somebody didn't pay attention to a red flag going in, but through the grace and the strength of God, it's worked out, and, and, and the faithful person has remained faithful. So please hear me as I'm saying this. We're, we're the ideal is lacking, grace abounds. But that is more to show God's forgiveness and mercy and strength and not to give us excuses to just live however we want. We should pay attention to red flags because overwhelmingly, when we don't, it leads to death. Another way uh, that we can go astray or allow uh, sin in our lives is by turning a blind eye to red flags. What I mean by this is that we can purposely but subtly blind ourselves when somebody is telling us who they are and what they are, but we don't pay attention to it, we don't listen to it. 
Uh, this ability to spot lies is in each of us intuitively, instinctively. We know when somebody is lying. A good example of this is when somebody is smiling with just their mouth, but not their eyes. Like this. It's creepy. You should know something's not right with that person. And they're not telling you anything but with body language. But we know when somebody's lying. If somebody is fidgeting a lot, sometimes that's a telltale sign. When people overqualify or overexplain, no, I'm telling you the truth. Hear me, read my lips. I, when people overqualify, oftentimes it's a good sign they're lying. Mothers seem to have a double portion of lie detection skills. You've heard of a mother's intuition. They know when the kids are lying. They know when something ain't right. So again, kids, watch out. <laughs> Can't, you can pull a fast one on dad. Don't try and pull a fast one on mom. The last one I want to talk about is desperation. Sometimes we get into desperate places, and when we turn to God, that's okay. But when we are really desperate and hungry, we are vulnerable to people who would want to lead us astray. You've heard the old saying, don't shop when you're hungry, because you buy things you don't need. And be careful what you listen to when you're hungry, because you'll accept some things you wouldn't normally. There was a con man named Henry Oberlander, such an effective con man that British authorities said that he could have undermined the entire banking system of the Western world. You can't find him uh, much information about him on Google, but he did do an interview once, and he said, I've got one rule. He said, everyone is willing to give you something. They're ready to give you something for whatever it is you're hungry for. That's the crux of the issue. You need to know what you're hungry for, what you're desperate for, because there are con men who are listening for what you're desperate for, what you really want, and that's how they get you. So I ask you, what are you hungry for? Validation? Are you desperate to be validated as a great man or a great woman? Beware. Flatterers will come with their flattery. And they will con you. Are you hungry for comfort and ease and leisure? Beware, because people will sell you a false gospel promising the easier, softer way. And in the end, it leads to death. You need to know what you're hungry for because that's a place where you could be led astray. And I want you to know, hunger isn't a bad thing. Hunger actually leads us to where there's food. And if you're desperate for life, God has given you Mount Gerizim. He's given you a path to be fed and be filled. But you need to be wise where you go to fill yourself. Amen? Don't fill yourself with junk food. We uh, had a great time at the Teen Young Professionals Campus Worship Night in Seattle this last Friday. Five of us drove up there. And on the way back, we're like, hey, let's eat some more food. Uh, so we stopped at Popeye's Chicken, uh, which most of the, the people in my car had never had before. I don't even know if we have a Popeye's in Bellingham. Ah, Lyndon for the win. Uh, and it's good. Uh, but one of the young guys that was with us, Caleb, uh, he's 16 years old, Daisy's friend. So he had his own money. I On the way up, I had made everybody order off the value menu because I was paying. On the way back, he's like, I've got my own money. Can I just buy whatever I want? I was like, dude, it's your money. So they had a $15 chicken meal. And he, he bought it <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night. And they gave him extra food. They gave him eight pieces of chicken. It was more than he expected. Uh, so around midnight, um, we had dropped him off. He texted, I ate too much chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beware when you're desperate. Beware when you're hungry. Don't go to the junk food and fill yourself on it. You will regret it. Uh, like ancient Israel, 
we need to come back to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Remember that Moses began this portion of scripture by saying, see, look, we should look at the paths laid before us and really think about it. If we hunger for life and for happiness, look upon Mount Gerizim. God has blessings for you. He has happiness for you. And the way you get it is through obedience and trust in God. Not betting against him, but believing in him. You must trust that his laws are not given to keep you from delight, but from death. And if you follow God, all those blessings will come to you. You have to also look at Mount Ebal and understand that sin is real. There is a lion stalking us in the tall grass. And if you look carefully, you can see his eyes gleaming in the night. Do not allow yourself to be taken by surprise. Stay alert. Because the consequence is death. I wrote some extra notes here and I'm trying to decide if I want to go over it. Are you guys still with me for another five minutes? Okay, okay. God's word is a light for our path, a lamp for our feet. And he has given us his word in very clear ways so that we see the red flags. And his word is clear and we should not forget that fact. It's become popular to say the word is so complicated and there's so many various interpretations and you really don't understand the context. And really you need to get a Jewish rabbi to teach you all of the Jewish history so that you understand that it's not that hard. It's not. God hates this doctrine. Right before he got into blessings and curses, right before he said this, this commandment, which I'm commanding you today, it's not too difficult for you. It's not far away. It's not in heaven that you could say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. Nor is it beyond the sea in some foreign land, some foreign idea. So you'll ask who will cross the sea for us and get it and proclaim it to us so that we can follow it. On the contrary, the word's near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart that you may follow it. God does not want us to be led astray. He's clear. And yet we get led astray. There are people telling us it's not clear. You need me to teach you. Now listen, we do need some help sometimes. There are portions of scripture that are difficult. While scripture is never wrong, our interpretations sometimes are. I grew up in a church that was a non-clapping church. We believed it was a sin to clap. It was an innovation that we don't see in the New Testament where we are told to make music with our hearts. So making any kind of music with your hands, off limits. Instruments, <laughs> that's heretical. And that was an interpretation. Now, sometimes those interpretations lead to very bad applications too. Not only did we believe this and take a conservative position to be safe and please God, we also judged those who did clap. We looked down at the clapping churches and even encouraged Christians not to fellowship with the clapping churches. So we get things wrong, church. We interpret scripture wrong sometimes. And when we interpret wrong, we apply it wrong also. But far and wide, scripture is clear. Overwhelmingly, he has made it clear. And when we get confused, it's because we allow ourselves to. We've blinded ourselves out of our desperation and hunger for what our itching ears want to hear. So again, Red flags are here. They're clear. They're for your salvation. Heed them. Listen to them. And one final caveat. You may ask, what, what about when I do fall? 
What about when I make a mistake? And I said it earlier, when the ideal is lacking, grace abounds. And praise God that he sent Jesus Christ for us to be our atoning sacrifice. Somebody may ask, you know, if I make a mistake, am I going to be cursed? Are all the curses of Mount Ball going to fall on me? And the short answer is yes. Wherever there is sin, there is death. Wherever there is disobedience, there is curse. I don't want to shy away from that or make excuses or make apologies for the Bible. The long answer is that that curse doesn't have to fall on you. Because God sent his son to let that curse fall on him. In Galatians 3, I want you to read this with me. It says, those who depend on following the law to make them right are under a curse. Because the scriptures say, anyone will be cursed who does not obey what is written in the book of law. Now it's clear that no one can be made right with God by the law. Because the scriptures say those who are right with God will live by faith. The law isn't based on faith. It says a person who obeys these things will live because of them. Christ took away the curse the law put on us. He changed places with us and put himself under the curse. It is written in the scriptures, anyone whose body is displayed on a tree is cursed. And sure enough, Jesus was on that tree so that he could take the curse for us. And so we can't look to Mount Ebal and be saved. We can look to Ebal and be warned, and we should. But we cannot look on Mount Ebal and be saved. We must look upon Christ. Only in him is there salvation. Does that mean that we should go on sinning that grace may abound? Surely not. But as those who learn through mimicry, as we follow Jesus, as a toddler stumbles as it's learning to walk, as a toddler mumbles as they're learning to speak, we are growing up in the image of Christ. We are becoming more like him. As long as we keep our eyes on him and learn to mimic him, Though we stumble, we will grow and be blessed. Now we're going to take communion. Communion is a time for us to remember what he did for us. And if you have made Jesus your Lord and your eyes are on him, this is a time that is very special for you. You are remembering that the curse is not not on you. It's on Jesus. That his broken body and his blood wash you clean. If you have not made Jesus Lord, This is a fun time to have a snack and sing a song. And it can be valuable, I think, in pointing you towards Christ. But I'm being honest, you're not participating in the real significance of communion. And Jesus wants to invite you to participate fully. He wants you to have communion in a way that you're actually remembering, the curse has been lifted off of me. My sin is no longer on me. I just want to encourage anybody who hasn't made Jesus Lord, choose life today. Choose life today. God is inviting you to be with him. And I want to encourage you, study the Bible with a friend. Study the Bible with a mentor. Learn what it means to follow Jesus and make him Lord. So that when you take communion, you're remembering that the curse has been lifted from you too. Let's go to God in prayer. Uh, Father, we love you so much, and we are so very grateful for your son, Jesus. We're so very grateful that we don't have to be perfect in following all of your laws and commands. Help us remember at the same time we should strive to follow Jesus with all of our strength. As we take the bread and the, the juice, help us remember, it, God, that sin is not something good. Sin has the stench of death on it. It caused Jesus, our Lord, to to be killed. I pray that we can remember that, that we can hate our sin and 
just be grateful that it's not counted against us. Um, We love you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.